Share screen. Do you, Gabby, do you want me to kick off? Hello? Yes, Anthony, that would be wonderful. Okay. Well, uh, greetings to you all. Um, I mentioned to Gabby at, um, in our briefing yesterday that... Um, I don't know what to do here. Participants. I'm, I'm going to be mentioning one or two articles. Um, I can hear him. Well, we can hear it. We don't have to see the whole screen. Yeah. Um, there's a couple people? that of people that are unmuted. Could you please mute your phones? A man and a woman. Mute my phone. Where is it? Good. Okay, so um, I mentioned to Gabby yesterday that I'm going to be mentioning one or two um, publications uh, or articles. And if anybody wants copy, copies of them, please just email me and I will email them to you. Um, Hi, Rich House can give you my email address or you can find it in the journal. Good. Um, the, the reason for my talk was I've noticed over the course of the last few years that one runs into impediments to healing, things that appear to stop healing taking place. And what I wanted to do in this talk is simply to go over some of the things that in my experience have um, stopped healing occurring, that have been uh, an impediment, a block. Um, and once we look at, once we see these things, it allows us to, you know, if, if we can discover or figure out what the impediment is, we can stop the garbage thinking and then the healing can take place. Um, and I would just like to start by saying that healing is going to be hard to come by if we do not understand the process of Christian science and Christian endeavor itself. And it's also going to be hard to come by unless we realize what it is that Mrs. Eddy actually discovered, um, what this science of being really is. I would, however, before getting to the meat of those two, two, two issues, just mention one, one particular um, bit of enlightenment, which I think is critical to all our understandings of what it means to be Christian science, it means to be Christian, and it means to be a healer. And one of the great impediments to healing is actually ignoring the fact that we never became human in the first place. If we realize that we never became human, the human condition actually becomes irrelevant. But mankind is under this impression that, well, I became human. I am human currently now. And that human corporeal model, if we adopt it, is necessarily rather fragile. And the back of the human conundrum is this belief that we were bored and we became human. Take that out of the equation and effectively we step off this escalator of, of humanity. We are no longer subject to sin, sickness and death. All of which are a consequence of a belief of having been born. If you give up the belief that you've been born, that you became human, then you don't have to deal with the consequences of that false belief. And I've found in my practice this one truth is probably the most one of the most effective treatments around. And I can think of at least five or six <laughs> occasions where somebody's called me and said, I'm so sick, I think I'm going to die. And I've, all I've read basically said is, at what point did you become human? And I can almost hear the silence down the phone. And then something interesting happens because you give up the belief that you became human, you change the way you think. Um, I had occasion last year to share this point with a lady who, who phoned me to say that she was suffering from cancer. And I, and I said to you, know, at what point did you become human? And again, I could hear the silence down the phone. 
and three days later she went in for a biopsy because and the surgeon woke her from the anesthetic to announce that he didn't understand what had happened that she hadn't got a trace of cancer left in her so if there is one thing that you take away from um, our meeting tonight is just this idea but i never actually became human and this sort of bears out and puts into context what Jesus said. Um, the only man who ever ascended to heaven was he who came down from heaven. And Jesus also said, you know, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So unless we find the Christ in ourselves, unless we correctly identify ourselves as the Christ, that being our true selfhood, that represents a huge stumbling block in our ability to be healed because unless we make that, um, step, take that step, we're going to be still thinking out from the standpoint, I'm a human being, I've got a problem. Um, and Mrs. Eddy also says that um, the only real man is the Christ man. To emphasize this point, there is only one man, which is the Christ man. It doesn't matter that it seems somewhat bizarre. It doesn't seem, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's a slightly strange concept for the human to have to take on board. But the fact of the matter is if you give up the idea that you actually became human, you're going to lose a lot of the problems which relate to your humanity. Um, the second point, and I, I do say this because I, I suffered from this this lack of clarity myself, is I didn't really understand the, the challenge that Christian science represented, but things became clear to me when I realized that Christian science is really about leaving Egypt and getting to the promised land. And Egypt is that place where our thinking is driven by the human body and the human personality. And we get to the promised land where the divine mind is found to be our mind. Um, and this is when, when Jesus said, I and my father are one. Basically, he was saying, I have the mind of God. What is interesting is that we don't get to the promised land without really understanding the, the whole issue of personal sense. As long as the ego is, is the human personality, we've got a problem because Mrs. Eddy tells us the ego is mind. And I never really got to the grips with this whole problem of personal sense, this problem of leaving Egypt, finding the divine mind to be my mind, until I really understood what Mrs. Eddy says um, on page 261 of Science and Health. The understanding that the ego is mind and that there is but one mind or intelligence begins at once to destroy the errors of mortal sense and supply the truth of immortal sense. Now, what's interesting about that is you can actually read those words and you can give assent to the idea that the only ego is mind. But you can still afterwards continue operating with the sense, well, but I also have a mind of my own. I can think what I like. And that is where you start to realize the problem that personal sense represents. We can't afford to have two egos. We've got to understand that the ego is mind. And it's one of those issues which I think we have to work at continually to make sure that we don't slip back into having the human personality operating as the ego, but we understanding, but we understand that the ego is mind. Curiously, one of the things that helped me the most in getting a better understanding of this issue, in the first edition of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, um, Mrs. Eddy uses the phrase personal sense on almost every page and sometimes twice a page, and it really wakes you up reading that 
um, edition really wakes you up to the issue of what personal sense is. For anybody who's interested and wants to have, I've, I've made a summary of those quotations from the first edition on personal sense. So if you'd like to have a printout of them, just email me and I will forward them to you. But let me um, just quote you some of the things that she does say in the first edition about personal sense. Thoughts from soul are ideas and from the brain beliefs. The former proceed from spiritual sense are not substance and are harmonious. The latter are products of personal sense and inharmonious. So here she is making the distinction of thoughts which come from soul and come from brain beliefs. To love our neighbor as ourself is an idea from soul. This idea personal sense cannot see, feel or understand, but spiritual sense can. And here is one quote, which I, I think to me is the clincher, which I wish she put in the, best, in, in the current, left in the current edition. She says, mesmerism is a direct appeal to personal sense, proceeds from it and derives its only prestige from belief. Mesmerism is personal sense giving the lie to its own statements. So here, for some reason, in this edition, she's, she's laying out the real nature of the beast. She says, personal sense is mesmerism. So if you're operating from the standpoint of the, pers the, the human personality, you are mesmerized. And mesmerism is exi exists as a faculty of you know, this human personality. But again, if one doesn't understand that, your thinking is continued, will continue to be obfuscated by this problem that personal sense uh, represents. The correct thing is to understand that um, the ego is mind. Okay, this other point, thinking like God. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that what it was that Mrs. Eddy, what Christian science actually represents as a science, what Mrs. Eddy discovered. And to my sense, Mrs. Eddy basically realized that if we think like God, then we're going to have the same experience as God. It makes sense. You know, if we're thinking, if our mind is operating as the divine mind, um, then we're going to have this, the same experience as that mind. And that, to my mind, is what Mrs. Eddy discovered. This is what the, the, the Christ science is all about. But because we don't understand this principle, we make no attempt to think like God and keep the garbage of human opinions out. So it's critical to our practice of Christian science that we realize what we're, in, what we're doing is to getting our minds to the point where they operate as the divine mind. I think what was interesting when Mrs. Eddy first started practicing Christian science, she said to one of her uh, students, I didn't understand how I did it. People were just being healed and I didn't understand why. Hence, she spent three years in her attic in Linen in, in, in Massachusetts, trying to figure out exactly what had happened. And to my sense, what she realized was that her mind had started operating as the divine mind and the effect of that mind was healing. Um, so what we're, what, and, and if we don't realize that, we don't realize that we've got to allow our minds to operate at the level of the divine mind, the healing isn't going to take place because what we're not doing is seeing the protocols which are necessary, the science which is necessary in order for our wholeness, the healing to appear. And if we won't make the effort to allow our minds to operate at that level, then we're gonna continue with the garbage sashing around as our thinking. And if I say that, I'm mean, I, I, sorry, this sounds like a horror story, but um, there are certain traits of thought which are really debilitating unless we get rid of them. And what one doesn't realize is the debilitating effect of things such as self-pity, 
resentment, superstition, all of which pretend they are sentiments which are justified. Now, I, I basically, I think I, I, I can truthfully say that I suffered from depression for the best part of 20 years. And the reason for it was actually quite simple. I indulged in self-pity. And the strange thing was, I didn't see the self-pity. I felt the effects of it, but I didn't see the self-pity. All I felt was the, the effects of it, the depression. I didn't see it. And yet one morning, I woke up and one, it was like somebody speaking to me and said, well, you will continue to suffer from depression if you continue to feel sorry for yourself. But you see, what, it hap what, what happens in these circumstances is that something is blocking the healing taking place because it, there is a, a residue of mortal mind thinking in thought, which we've got to get rid of. And if we don't recognize it, we don't get rid of it. And in my case, the, the, the issue was one of self-pity, which first of all, I hadn't recognized. And when I recognized it, uh, I was able to deal with it. But there are other similar uh, things like resentment, superstition, um, and where, where mortal mind is so clever, <laughs> it says, oh, well, they're perfectly justified. You, you're perfectly, you know, you're perfectly entitled. Um, it's perfectly right that you feel um, self-pity. I mean, you were very badly treated, et cetera, et cetera. And that is where we get thought. Uh, that is where we get caught. Um, and we have to recognize that is the way that mortal mind operates. It's always going to say to you, um, well, your sense of self-pity, the resentment, whatever it is, is justified. Um, okay, in, in that context, um, I'd like to quote Mrs. Eddy, Mrs. Eddy's experience with Waldo Emerson. As you probably all know, Waldo Emerson was a, an em, eminent philosopher um, of his time and a contemporary of Mrs. Eddy. And in the book for, um, called Christian Science, its encounter with American culture, there is this following extract about Mrs. Eddy's failure to heal Waldo Emerson. I quote, in this connection, a curious incident occurred some months before his death. Mrs. Eddy went, with, went to Waldo Emerson Without the benefit of Alcott as an intermediary, she realized her long held ambition to meet the Sage of Concord. In an undated letter to an unidentified Miss Lane of, Concord, uh, of Chicago, she wrote, Waldo Emerson was a man fitting a niche in history well, and we all in Massachusetts love him. But he was far from, but he was as far from accepting Christian science as a man can be who is a strict moralist. Bronson Alcott is far in advance of him. I saw Emerson some months before his demise, demise went for the purpose of healing him. Let no one but my husband, Dr. Eddy, who went with me know it. As soon as I got into the deep recesses of his thoughts, I saw his case was hopeless. I can only work by God's graces and by his rules. So when I said in reply to his remark, I am old and my brains are wearing out from hard labor and then chattered like a babe. But I remarked, but you believe in the powers of God above all other causation, do you not? He answered me, yes. And this followed in substance, but it would be profane for me to believe a man does not wear out. I do not believe God can or wants to prevent this result of old age. So all of a sudden, here you've got Waldo Emerson, the great, one of the great philosophers of his age, meeting Mrs. Eddy, one of the great healers of her age, and yet she could not heal him because there was a blockage, and the blockage was the prejudices. I'm entitled to think what I want. I'm not going to give up my point of view. Again, I think we have to understand the process of Christian science treatment 
Um, and what it is, we're being asked to understand. We're being asked to examine thought, to see effectively which tree we've climbed, because it's, it's very easy to recognize the fruit, but it's somewhat more difficult to recognize the tree. And, you know, with my own experience of, of dealing with uh, depression, because I couldn't detect the problem, I couldn't deal with the fruit, I, the healing wasn't coming. Immediately, I detected the problem where the garbage think, where what the nature of the garbage thinking was, I was able to deal with it. Um, and perhaps I could expound on this a little bit. Um, I'd like to cite the case of a young woman who called me about, it was about two years ago, um, because she wanted assistance. Um, she, she, was, she couldn't conceive children. And after a few weeks of working with her, I woke up one morning and it suddenly became clear to me that the divine mind was extremely fertile. The issue was not with the patient. The issue was understanding something about the divine mind, which would set aside the pretension of mortal mind that somebody was sterile. And what happened in this instance was the realization that the divine mind was fertile. Therefore, the whole concept of infertility was a lie. And I had experience, I think we all have experience of the fertility of the divine mind. Sometimes we, <laughs> excuse me, we seem to be confronted with the most horrendous situation and God out of nowhere seems to be able to provide an answer. I mean, the divine mind really is extraordinarily fertile. We can think we're at a crossroads and God says, oh no, there's a solution. And we experience the fertility of the divine mind. And I experienced it, I saw it. And two days later, she called me and said, I'm pregnant. And, you know, I, I've, I've shared this with, with um, people I've been working with uh, or friends, and um, they, they've had the same experience with other, um, with, with patients, the people they've been working or family. They've realized that the divine mind was fertile and the infertile daughter or what it, or relation um, ends up being pregnant. So when we are confronted with a problem, basically we are being challenged to understand something about the divine mind which sets that challenge aside. Uh, and again, I think it's a process, it's a question of understanding the process. We've got the problem, we turn to God to, to realize what it is about his nature that negates this apparent problem. Um, what is going to be a roadblock to healing is the refusal to accept the challenge and the, allow the divine mind to unfold its own nature. After all, Jesus did say, it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, it's God's good pleasure to explain his own nature. And from my own experience, there are times when I, you know, some problem has come up and I, I, I've said to myself, I really don't want to have to deal with this. Um, and yet, um, the fact that we have enough courage to say, okay, Father, let God take you by the hand and show you why it's not a problem. Um, and I've always loved the example of Moses uh, being confronted with an arm covered in leprosy. And I have the sense that he basically went back to God and said, okay, show me why this is not a problem. And his prayers were answered. Um, the mistake is to feel overwhelmed and in despair at the challenge. And if the sense of despair is there, the healing is just not going to happen. And often the despair is the problem that needs healing. Um, uh, perhaps you allow, allow me to ex um, extrapolate on that a bit. A friend of mine was out cross-country skiing and he tore his Achilles tendon. The next day he was in great pray pain and praying to resolve the situation. <laughs> a little boy said to him, you haven't got the first idea how this can be healed through spiritual means. To which my friend said, he agreed, yes. <laughs> no, Father, I haven't the faintest idea. And then the little voice added, 
and you are completely in despair, aren't you? To which my friend also agreed. At one point, this little boy said, guess what? There is no despair in the kingdom of heaven. And my friend understood that. It's not difficult to read. The divine mind is free of despair. The moment he realized um, that the divine mind was totally free of despair, he went from having a torn Achilles tendon to a fully repaired Achilles tendon in a split second. It just happened immediately. So here you've got a, a, a wonderful instance of what's the blockage? The blockage is bad thinking, despair, resentment, whatever it is. Figure it out. Figure out where that, what that issue is. With God's help, Father, show me, you know, show me why this is not a problem. And um, then, the, um, then the problem gets repaired. One other impediment to healing is um, hanging on to the idea that we can be victims. And I think it's, it's um, um, sometimes things happen and they happen in series and you end up feeling like a victim. Um, and that is something that as a Christian scientist, we, it's completely illegitimate to feel like a victim because, you know, that's a function of duality. There has to be God and then something else for there to be a victim. But there isn't, there's just God. There is that singularity of, of entity, which says, there, no, there isn't room for a victim when God is all in all and the only entity there is. So it's completely legitimate uh, to feel that you can be a victim. And I know in my own case that, you know, that came in very useful. Um, as a CPA, I, um, I went into the Christian Science Practice in 2005. I sold my CPA business. But seven years after um, I'd sold the business, I got sued by one of my former clients personally. It was a complete, you know, um, complete nonsense. Um, it was a sort of legal fishing expedition, but I still found myself in the crosshairs for a $4 million lawsuit, which was extremely unpleasant. And I couldn't figure out for a long time what I needed to understand to get over this problem. And finally, um, uh, I read an article by Richard Bergenheim um, called No Need to Be a Victim, or I think it's called There Are No Victims. And I realized that the, the problem was I'd allowed my thought to operate as if I was capable of being a victim. And as soon as I got over it, um, the, um, the complainant, the plaintiff was forced to withdraw his complaint. Now, I actually, to be honest with you, I did not enjoy, you know, being on the receiving end of that problem for the best part of three years, but it came in very useful uh, a few years later when a friend of mine who was a farmer in Rhodesia, Rhodesia complained to me that um, a local government minister was trying to um, expropriate his land and give it to the prime minister as a present. And I literally, you know, we, I slightly laughed about it. I said, don't worry, I said, you're not going to be a victim uh, of this problem. And sure enough, within three weeks, um, how can I euphemistically put it? The, um, the local government minister found himself no longer in a position to be able to pursue that particular avenue with my friend's land. And he was, uh, as he said to me, nobody's going to be touching my land for a very long time to come. So it's, I know that sometimes the challenges, I, you don't want them, but it's worth dealing with them because not only do you learn something, but also you're in a position to be able to help other people afterwards making sure I'm keeping track of the time here. Um, I would also add that it's very difficult to be healed if you feel inadequate. And I think a lot of, a lot of the patients coming to me, there is that basic sense, I, I'm not up for this. I, I'm not able to do it. I feel inadequate. And yet the word adequate is interesting. It means created equal to. And when I first realized that one morning, 
I remembered St. Peter's words about Jesus. He did not think it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus never felt inadequate. And it's also completely um, illegitimate for us to feel inadequate either, because we're, you know, we have the mind of God. We have the same resources that Jesus had. Um, so feeling inadequate is not, it's not legitimate. And what was odd in this particular case, when this word started banging around in my head and I was forced to deal with the issue, um, was that I went into the office um, and that afternoon I received a telephone call from the intendant of a uh, opera house in Sweden where my wife was due to sing Chirondot, saying that they couldn't do the, they couldn't honor the contract because they didn't have the money. And the strange thing was I, I was so taken up with this idea that um, every, everyone is adequate and no institution is inadequate for the purpose for which it was created. That sense of adequacy was so profound. I said, oh, okay, fine. I just let, I didn't, I didn't tell my wife, I didn't tell her agent. I was so, so wrapped up in this idea of the adequacy of God, uh, what that meant for the, for the, for the, the, for man to understand that he was always adequate. And within a week later, I got a, a fax from him saying, we've had a miracle. We found, we found the money to do the production. So that was a nice example again of getting rid of a roadblock. And I, I didn't, up until that time, I, <laughs> excuse me, I didn't see the problem that a sense of inadequacy represented. Um, I would say that also these examples emphasize the point that matter is not what needs healing. Um, and Mrs. Eddy has written a very good article on the issue of there is no matter, which you can find on page 31 of Unity of Good. Um, and within that context, I would say that it's worth taking on board the idea, the concept, that if there is no matter, there is nothing outside of mind. Everything must be included in mind because there is no matter. If we do not realize there is nothing outside of mind, then we're going to come unstuck in our treatment because we will be laboring under the delusion that there is a material object out there that needs to be healed. But the fact of the matter is there is nothing outside of mind. And we repeat every Sunday, the scientific statement of being which says there is no life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. All is infinite mind in its infinite manifestation. But the problem, the problem is, You've got to, to see the consequences of that. Mrs. Eddy's very good at pointing out the truth, but she isn't always quite so good at saying, well, in the circumstances, you've got to realize there are consequences to this truth. There, is, there are consequences to this particular truth. So bearing in mind there is nothing outside of mind must mean, therefore, that everything that appears within consciousness is actually a divine idea conceived by mind and maintained by mind. Not as a material object, but as a divine idea. And that helps us. As I had one patient call me and said he'd smashed his hand in a piece of agricultural machinery. And he said he'd been down to the, um, um, he'd been down to the hospital and they told him that it was so badly damaged that he would probably lose the use of his hand. And what was interesting that morning, the same morning he told me about it, at 10.30, I was doing my lesson sermon and something literally, like somebody speaking to me, said, there is nothing outside of mind. And I, it was so, so forceful, I had to write it in the margin of my quarterly. So when Philip calls me at, at uh, one o'clock, says, I, you know, I smashed my hand, how can you help? Um, I was able to say, well, I said, it happened at 10.30. And he said, well, how do you know? I said, because... At 10.30, something said to me, there is nothing outside of mind. He said, well, how does that help me? And I said, well, in the circumstances, you have to realize that there is nothing outside of your um, mind. Then your, your hand must be a divine idea conceived by mind and maintained by mind. This doesn't have any materiality to it. But the implication is it's a divine idea conceived by mind, maintained by mind. 
and within 48 hours that hand was completely healed. Um, again, but one needs to realize the implications of what Mrs. Eddy is saying when she says there is no life, truth, substance, and intelligence in matter. It means that everything is an idea held within mind. I just want to make sure we've got enough time. So uh, I think we can, I get through this last one. Um, one of the, the great stumbling blocks, I think, is also this false belief that matter or material circumstances could help us in any way. Um, a Christian scientist I know found himself unable to walk following a ski accident, which had damaged his back. While under Christian science treatment for the resolution of this problem, he read the following paragraph from an address by Clarence Steves, who's a Christian science teacher. And Clarence Steves writes, why do we seem so reluctant to yield up this ghost of personal sense, this mortal so-called mind for the mind that is unerring in its directness? Why should it be so difficult to yield up this personal sense of mind with its variableness, its erring nature, fearful transitory so-called thoughts, its doubtful and negative sense for the mind which knows only perfect being. And then he says something very interesting. Is it because we have not seen the awfulness of the so-called human mind, its enmity to God, its murdering thievery? Jesus surely looked into it and saw its illusionary nature, lifted the curtain from its birth to its death and said it was a liar and the father of its own lies. Now, I, I must confess that I was the, uh, the, the, the beneficiary of the ski accident in question. And when I read that particular phrase, I realized that there was no, that the, the, the human experience and the divine reality were two entirely different things. And I had to make a separation within my mind between the two things. It was like, you know, God saying, here's a sword, cut it. And I was able literally to distance myself completely from the human conundrum. Um, and I, because, you know, here's God pointing out saying, look, the mortal mind is no friend. It's awfulness, it's thievering, adulterous nature is not something that should, should make it appear appealing to you. And it was literally, I, I literally was able to make that I was able to get out of bed to go to the bathroom the first time in, in three days. But what was interesting was I looked back into the bed and my body was still there. Didn't last for very long, but it lasted long enough for me to realize that the, the so-called human, um, the, the so human construct is not appealing in any way. But also to, to realize that allows you, allows you to distance yourself from it. And that is when the healing takes place. So um, it is, again, it's, it's within those, those parameters that um, I find that um, we have to learn to solve our problems by realizing that um, the impediment is some false belief that needs to be dealt with. And um, I had another instance of, of um, this uh, last week, uh, somebody I was helping who had heart disease for some reason during the week, I realized that the human, the human mind tends to operate with a sense of foreboding. It's not always fearful, but it has this tendency to think, well, this could go wrong and that could go wrong. And that sense of foreboding is a real heartache. Um, and I shared that, you know, I shared that idea with, with my friend. Um, and I said, Look, you know, you've got to get rid of the sense of foreboding. And he said, yes, you're quite right. I spent my life worrying about when things are going to go wrong. And the next time he was in hospital being tested, the, 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 um, the, the doctor was able to assure him that despite the fact up until that point, he'd had a very serious heart disease, that the heart disease was completely, uh, completely healed. So in some, that is the summary of what I feel we need to deal with when we're confronted with something that says, this situation is incurable. Gabby, I'll hand the microphone back to you, if I may. Uh, 
Okay, thank you so much, Anthony, for such an inspiring talk. What a wonderful way for all of us to start our weekend. And thanks to all of you for joining High Ridge House for our monthly healing thought. Goodbye. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Are, you going, are you going to provide um, Mr. Whitehouse's email address? Thank you. Oh, yes. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Also, yeah, how do we get in, how do we get in touch email, with him? My email thank address you. is, my, my email address is very simple. You.